Hey guys, this one I am really looking forward to. This is my absolutely adorable friend, Zoe Belshaw, Dr. Zoe Belshaw. And she is as passionate about OA as I am. OA being arthritis. Sorry guys, right at the beginning, if we say OA, we mean arthritis. It's just the abbreviation that we tend to use. So I'm going to let Zoe introduce herself, tell the story um, of how she got obsessed, and then we're going to crack on with looking through all of her amazing work. So, Zoe, head off. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm Zoe. I'm a vet. Um, I graduated about 17 years ago, one year behind Hannah in vet school. Um, and um, so, I trained, um, my background is an internal medicine specialist. So I am maybe a bit unusual for one of the people on here that I've not got an orthopedic background or a neurology background. I got into doing endoscopies and bone marrows and that kind of that kind of a case. But then alongside that, whilst I was working at a university, my own dog developed osteoarthritis. And um, it was a little scruffy, hairy terrier, and um, he ruptured his cruciates and subsequently developed osteoarthritis in both of his both of his knees. Um, and I realised that I was making really bad decisions. I couldn't really make decisions. Actually, I was really irrational. I was fearing the worst about what was going to happen, but then not actually wanting to do an examination I was really scared of NSAID side effects so non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug side effects to the point I really didn't want to give them and I didn't really know where to go for advice and it really made me think gosh if this is me as a vet surrounded by vet friends that I can call on and I don't know what to do and I'm making these decisions that I know aren't rational but are so emotionally driven then what must, be, must it be like for other owners who mm. aren't vets, who don't have access to this amazing knowledge pool that I do? And mm. so that then was certainly one of the big drivers that led me to go on to do a PhD that looked at the experiences of GP vets and owners within the UK, as well as doing some research about, um, about quality of life assessment and how osteoarthritis is is kind of assessed in in general um and so i'm still publishing albeit a few years down the line um bits of those work and the seminal part of that was um going to 40 households and spending hours talking to owners about what how their lives have changed what they've done differently how they'd worked alongside vets what what would worked really well what they were worried about how they conceptualized osteoarthritis and also going to veterinary practices and doing focus groups with vets um, so sitting down with a bunch of vets and saying, what do you do when you get a case of case of OA coming through the door? How do you manage it? What do you find tricky? And then putting all of that together. So we've got those two sides of the, the story in the consulting room, basically. And um, we can start to then understand really for the first time what happens in a general practice setting with, with dogs with osteoarthritis. Because as I'm sure you may be aware, if you watch these CAM conversations, lots of this work is done by experts who are maybe seeing a different population of cases mm. to those that we see in general practice, uh, maybe more higher up joint problems, maybe more dogs that are likely to have surgical problems rather than the, you know, the the, the oldest multi-joint stiff dogs that we maybe see in general practice. So yeah, that's kind of... And that's I think you're, um, but your thesis has just led on and led on and led on. You've done work about um, quality of life, health-related quality of life, trying to distinguish what that really means, quality of life, that overlap massively with welfare, chronic pain. You've also done, and we're going to touch on it later, and it's I, I love it, I've watched it so many times, is your presentation about Dr. Google and should we be scared? I think that was an insane, insane presentation. <laughs> and then you've also done recently some work about how two people can be in the room, the vet professional and the owner, and they can be having a conversation, but be on completely different timelines, you know, different, different yeah. aspects and thought processes. So we've got a lot to cover tonight, guys. What we want to experiment with, this is an experiment, you are part of the discussion. Both of us are really, really fascinated in this topic and we want to bring reality to the vet profession. So we both lecture, we both get asked to contribute to different consultancies. So what you say tonight isn't gonna to be a dead end. It doesn't stop at a brick wall. It goes with both me and Zoe into our further work. So please don't be shy to comment. 
please pour your hearts out because we can use this when we communicate back to our colleagues and we can make changes that need to be changed. So get your fingers typing. But let's start off with the thesis and what's the, the things that you found. So the title of your thesis, and then we can work from there. That's a great question. Let me look at it. <laughs> the thesis for people that haven't seen it, and I've never got around to printing mine, but it's a big fat book, basically. You kind of you write up a big thing like this. So it's decision making and welfare assessment in canine osteoarthritis is what my what my thesis was called. Um, and so it had three big uh, sections, I guess, in it. Uh, the first one was doing a couple of reviews, which if you saw the cam chat with Mike Conzemius, he mentioned the terms of kind of systematic review. Um, and we did a couple of those. So what that is, is getting all of the published literature on a specific topic and doing a specific kind of way of searching for it so that you know you found everything with a, with, with a certain type of literature. And then kind of analysing that to, to really closely examine what's in there. And so we did that to have a look at what tools are available to assess quality of life in dogs in general. And we did one looking at all of the different ways that osteoarthritis can be assessed. And again, Mike was talking about this idea of subjective and objective assessments of arthritis, where a subjective assessment is what we think is going on. And an objective assessment is something where we make a measurement that we can maybe believe a bit more it's kind of more potentially hopefully more factual it's more reliable basically mm. so we wanted to find out basically for later on in the thesis are there good tools that are suitable for general practitioners and owners with pets in general practice that we can then adopt and highlight and take forward and, and trial in that situation so that was the first chunk of of what we did and um <laughs> It took a bit of a while. Um, but to summarise those two, we found that actually the quality of life tools are generally very um, disease specific. And so there are quality of life tools for dogs with heart disease, for dogs with certain neurological conditions and for obviously for dogs with um, with osteoarthritis. But the real challenge that we found then down the line when you're trying to put those into practice is that lots of dogs don't just have osteoarthritis. They also have heart disease. They also have mm. thyroid disease. And these tools were are very much developed with a focus on a single disease. And sometimes that makes them quite difficult to use in general practice when you've got dogs with, with lots of different problems where you're trying to disentangle what's the arthritis impact on my dog slowing down versus what's its laryngeal paralysis or yeah. what's its heart disease or you know what's the fact it's overweight for example so they we found those they, some of them were good but um we found there wasn't really a perfect one can and you mention we looking, any ones that are good because we know that a lot of people are now going to go i might need that in my life it, yeah i think we can come on to that because i think it really depends on what you what you what you want to measure i mean the ones that we would that were, were the best validated. So again, we went into the process of how are these things tested? Because anybody can make up a tool. I could make yes. up a tool today and say, hey, here's the thing, I've published it. It's got 20, 20 questions. But what you need to know is, are those questions right? So what, do owners recognize them? Do the vets recognize them as being relevant to this, to this situation? Are they actually asking the right kind of questions? And then, there's some tests that you can do that check basically whether or not when multiple people look at the same dog, do they score it the same? And if you mm. retest that score back to back again, does that With the score same change? person, whether they With score the same it person, the same. Exactly. And so there is, and that's called validation. And so there are a few of the tools that have been validated, which have been mentioned on here lots of times before. So there's the canine brief pain inventory. There's the load Liverpool osteoarthritis in dogs tool. And there's a canine orthopedic index with the three that at that point in time, when we did the review back in 2014, were the, were the kind of big three that came out. There's also mm -hmm. the Helsinki chronic pain index, which at the time I did the review hadn't been validated in English, but subsequently has right. been, I think. So I will I'll make sure that I'll put the link. Yeah. Yes. They're worth having a look at, but um, all of them have slight challenges when incorporating them into general practice um yeah. which we can have but there's certainly a good starting point and i know yeah. for my owners i quite often have a conversation saying are you quite numerically focused yeah. are you more um descriptive so i i like client specific outcome measures because i can teach at the same time now what a client specific outcome measure we're just going to tangent quickly would be an observation of your dog 
maybe something that they used to do, but they're no longer doing. And you've observed that that's now missing from their life. So that's something that we can observe if it comes back. Or it might be something that they've started doing that they didn't do before. And you think, well, I'd actually quite like to see that disappear. So an example would be the dog used to always greet me at the door when I came home, but now he's not doing that. Well, we want that back. Or it might be that the dog has become very anxious and very needy and doesn't want to leave me alone. And we want that to subside. So I love client specific outcome measures because I can actually explain why those behaviors have happened. So the owner's being taught. But some owners find that too wishy washy. And they'd much rather have a questionnaire where they can tick boxes and add up numbers and they can have 27 out of 52. And then the next week it's down at 14 and they're like, yes. Yeah. So they do appeal to different people, don't they? Yeah, as well. absolutely. I really like the client specific outcome measures <laughs> too. We didn't find any of those that have been validated for use in dogs. And Duncan LaSalle has done lots of work on them in cats. Yeah. Um, they're quite tricky to validate because obviously all the individual items are going to be very specific to that dog owner combination. So the questions you put in there are going to be about you and your dog. And that's what makes mm -hmm. them great. The tricky thing to test is actually, is that thing relevant? Is it going to change? Is it about mm -hmm. arthritis? But I, I personally, I personally really like them. So, yeah, we can totally stick those links in later on that people can Actually, follow yeah, if they want yeah. to have a look and see what they want to work with best. Yeah. Yeah. And we we as a collective, I believe, sorry, will join me in this. We really want the public to start using these things. They're there for a reason. They're not just for academia and for research. They're going to make your consultations more efficient with your vet. There's going to be more clarity during that consultation. And I would even go to say they're going to save you time and money because you're going to get to the point quicker. You're going to get your questions answered. You're going to see whether a medication or an intervention is working. You're going to get to change it if it's not. So they're really, really useful, but there's a big problem and we're going to come back to it. People aren't using them. <laughs> they're there, they've been there for years, but we'll come to that as we go on with your thesis. So, cool. please continue. Sorry, yeah. So. Um... Yes, yeah, so we did we did those two reviews and um, we then went on to a series of, as I said, interviews with owners. So we asked for volunteers. We got posters in 10 veterinary practices and say, hey, have you got a dog with arthritis? Would you like to be interviewed? And then I travelled from rural Devon up to inner city Glasgow and spoke to owners um, in their houses, which is brilliant. And if any of you are watching, I'm unbelievably grateful. Um, and if you're not, if you haven't been involved in one of these studies and you do get the opportunity to do research, I would say do go for it because it's so helpful for us to stand understand your perspectives. And my thesis would have been nothing, you know, without the owners that were involved. So, yeah, I went and hung out in people's houses um, and watched the dogs and talked to them about the dogs. And then analyze those interviews basically in a process called thematic analysis which is where you code different things that people have said and you kind of look at well how many people have said this thing how many people have said that thing and off the back of that we could then start to build up a broad set of kind of themes of common things that people have were interested in talking about really so we, we had a theme about what happened before the diagnosis what people noticed before their dog was first taken to the vets what stopped them going to the vets what facilitated them going to the vets mm. we had a theme around the relationship between the owner and a vet one around treatments and then one around euthanasia end of life decision making and quality of life and then we repeated a similar exercise then with veterinary practices but mainly focused around what do you do in that first consult and what do you do next and how do you make those decisions and then put all of that together and pretty much and then there was another bit where we t we tried out some collar monitors with um with owners of uh, some of the dogs to see how they got on and also tested out some of these tools that we've talked about already to see how owners found those to fill in sitting down next to them in a GP population saying, how do you find this question? Is that a good question, bad question, offensive question? This is easy why to fill in? I, I wanted you on here because you are probably the academic, the researcher that is so close to truth and reality in that you have been in first opinion practice. This is all data collected from the front line, um, which is very different to what we read in the textbooks. So, yeah. <laughs> so back to, yeah. to the interviews with owners and pets. Now I've quoted your work forever, I just say all the time, in every practice training, every owner setting, I have a list of findings from your thesis that are 
they're, they're kind of like topics, points of conversation to get the conversation started, but they're also shock factor. I, I, I do use it to kind of make people go, ooh, crikey, because they're quite potent. So off the top of my head, the ones I will think, I will quickly shout out, time is a big hindrance to everybody, which we know. Um, owners find it hard to identify chronic pain. Vets find it hard to identify chronic pain. Owners are hugely influenced by everybody bar the vet. <laughs> so they will be Mabel by the poo bin, there'll be online resources, magazines, you know, the person that runs the daycare, the groomer, will all very much influence that owner's decision making. And there's an irrational fear of non-steroidals which surpasses reality. So we know what we have in the data, the likelihood of a non-steroidal reaction um, and the likelihood it's not going to be severe, it's just a transient GI event. But the fear is quite outrageous in comparison. Can you kind of add to all that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think there's a good summary of the, the big findings. Really, <laughs> <laughs> um, Unpick them probably one by one, but I'd certainly start with the non steroidal inflammatories thing because this is a, it's something I, I do practices, um, general practice consultations still two days a week with the PDSA um, charity. And it's something I talk to owners about every day when we're talking about um, osteoarthritis in those consultations about which drugs we're going to use and why we're going to use them. And the best evidence for an effective treatment type at the moment in dogs with osteoarthritis remains non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. There's lots of evidence that suggests they are effective in reducing pain and, and, and the other associated clinical signs um, of osteoarthritis. But the challenge with them is, as, as many people will be very well aware, they, they can come with some side effects. Now, the tricky thing is, pretty much every drug will come with side effects and yet for some reason we've we're very much more nervous as veterinary professionals and as owners specifically about this class of drugs I think and I think um it totally works on both sides of the consulting room table and the big difficulty is that the risks are not very high but when they do happen potentially they can be quite significant and that's what we're worried about everybody's heard mm. kind of horror stories of of animals that have potentially died after non steroidal anti-inflammatory administration now the data would absolutely suggest that the biggest risks come from injectable rather than oral medication and usually injectable medication when it's given during an anesthetic so potentially when the dog's you know, blood mm. pressure is a little bit low or it's got other things having to be processed through the kidneys that that's what the data collected by the veterinary medicines directorate who collect mm. reports from vets and now owners about potential side effects um, would say the biggest risk is. So there's lots of challenges around this because there's a drug that we would kind of like to use that we know is quite effective, but we're, we're quite worried about. And we introduce it often as vets as, oh, there's these really good drugs, oh, but they've got these side effects. And so that's the almost the only time where we do that in a conversation with mm. owners about medications. We're usually like, oh, yeah, have some antibiotics. And we don't always necessarily talk about side effects, even though there potentially will be some. But the same, we are, potentially, yeah, potentially GI yeah, side effects. Absolutely. We, we, we're really worried about it. And the thing that makes the gastrointestinal side effects monitoring kind of an understanding what, what we've got in the, in the way of the number of side effects in the population is that it's really difficult to tell, was that the drug that did it? Or was that dog going to get gastroenteritis anyway? Is it just sniffed something? Is it eaten something? Is it drunk some muddy water? Is it a dog that has, you know, has been on raw food and it's eaten something that didn't agree with it? Who who knows? And that's the real challenge of the difference between what we call kind of not wanting to get too technical, but correlation and causation. So when two things happen at the same time, what we can't often say, even a dog on non steroid anti-inflammatories that gets horrible diarrhea, we can't, it's very, very difficult to impossible to say that is the cause of that because yeah. we don't know whether it would have happened anyway and yeah. so it's much easier to put together a and you know a and b or one and two and make three because that's what our brains want us to do we love making stories that's totally how the human brain works mm -hmm. we want to explain events and so actually it may be that 
the vets that you see and some of the owners you talk to have had an event like that in a dog where actually it was just a coincidence that those things happened but they've added yeah. that to the totally understandably added that to the bank of oh well there's another dog that got side effects of these drugs yeah. And so it's really tricky to actually get to understand these data and how significant these adverse events are. The other did, thing, uh, just just to say, just because I want people to know that you know there is, <laughs> there was a very simple solution that I did when I was um, starting to do lectures, and I wanted to to show the public the confidence vets have in dispensing these, and I think that's a really powerful thing. So I put a post out on a um, closed vet forum that had around about 600 to 700 vets at this point. And I said, knowing what you know, and considering how many times you see these adverse events, would you prescribe um, non-steroidals for your own dogs? And I had over 200 replies within 24 hours and all of them said yes. Interesting, yeah. I now use that whenever I do any kind of lectures because I do, I know it's not very scientific, but you have to admit if you've been in practice 20 years and if you'd seen horrendous side effects to that degree, you would go, I'm not using that drug anymore. Jesus Christ, not me, not me. But um, you're right. I think it's it's really difficult. And I know if I have an owner that comes in and says he got diarrhea on that drug, there's my brain saying, well, actually have a rest seven to 10 days and let's try again. Cause there's a very strong likelihood your dog was gonna get diarrhea cause it ate a dead rat from underneath the shed. So true yeah. yeah i think i think so i mean the other thing you can do is switch drugs so it may be that a dog reacts to one of them you give it a bit of a holiday and it reacts to something else um mm -hmm. or it doesn't you know sometimes you could go through two or three drugs and find the fourth one is is both effective and doesn't cause them any problems at all and i interviewed mm -hmm. owners who've been in that situation they get a massive tub of here's all the things we've tried and this is the one this is the one that works yeah. so i think it's it's a really important conversation to have with your vet around really when you know when these drugs are prescribed and equally for vets to have this conversation with owners what's the likelihood something's going to happen and that likelihood is tricky to measure but as Hannah absolutely says it's it's really relatively low but also really importantly if you do what do I look for and then what do I do if it happens mm -hmm. so when you're going to have a dog on these drugs the side effect we're mainly worried about is going to be gastrointestinal ulceration which often manifests as diarrhea or vomiting it will say on every printout on the label if your dog develops these signs, you know, stop, mm. stop giving the drug. And also the best way to avoid giving that is with food. And those mm. things are pretty well evidence-based. And if you follow those, those suggestions, then actually the chance of a significant side effect is probably extremely slim. The ones that we see are much more likely to be the dog that's unfortunately continue to be given this, this pain relief. Um, in yes. the face of having had those side effects or when it's you know separate to food because the owners haven't understood the instruction um, or because it's very difficult to administer the, that drug to that dog in that way yeah but, um, and I think we see that as well don't we as vets okay so owners and thank you Emily Jane Meadows for an amazing amazing input here we'll get back to that but as a vet for 19 years now a year older than Zoe Belshaw um I've seen some owners that the dog's got profuse diarrhea and they're plugging in the, met the I won't say a particular drug, but um, at the non-steroidal. And you're like, why did you do that? You know, it says, please don't do that. And then you have other owners where the dog basically was just like, not quite himself that morning, totally fine by the afternoon, but they won't touch it again. So we as vets see a very wide range of the population and different kind of attitudes to it. So in our defense, it's very, very hard to pitch it right. Because you get some owners that come in and they're like, I'm all ears, just tell me everything. I'm just gonna listen to every single word that you tell me, I am listening. And you've got other owners that are on their phone, the kids hanging off their trouser leg, they don't seem to be really listening to you at all. Yeah. So how can we do that? Have you got ideas of how we could actually gain client confidence and compliance adherence and, work better as a team yeah I think it's tricky and I think the the thing with any side effects is often there's a, there's a few different things again that compound the problem really of owners not necessarily knowing what to do or, or worrying if we're dispensing tablet medication into a separate pot rather than giving it out um with the um in a box it may not come with any client information at all so the only information might be on a tiny little label which may well get scuffed within a few days of using it or verbally from the vet. 
And so I think it would be incredibly helpful if we were always to give out information sheets. And actually, if those information sheets weren't just a packet insert, which are really hard to work with. Oh, my God, I, I find it so hard to read. Bespoke information would be amazing from vets about this is what happens. This is what this drug's about. These are the benefits of it. These are potentially the risks associated with it. That you need to keep an eye out for. So these Cam is going to write one. Awesome. We'll put it in our resources. That'd be it great. Yes. So then the vets can sign posts. Have a look at the CAM leaflet on this. That would save everybody time. It's a consistent resource. That would be really, really good. Um, yeah, it's a really tricky thing um, to, to get this right. I think if you don't look back at that label, would you learn what you need to do? It's really difficult to remember those. Um, those yeah. I think, I think a lot of it's having honest conversations about what is it we're trying to achieve? What are the sweet yes. options in front of us? And then what are the different pros and cons of those, basically? So we've got non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We've got the human drugs like tramadol, gabapentin, amantadine that we can use. We've got supplements. We've got behavioral change type things around the house, the exercise, the garden. We've got weight management. Of this suite of all the different things available for this dog in front of us and for the owner in front of us, really importantly, because everybody's got their own um you know ability to do different things it may be you're in a super busy household it might be a dog definitely won't take tablets and to try and match up what are we trying to achieve what level of risk confidence really are we happy to have because some owners don't want to risk anything and that's that's okay um but obviously the risk of not doing something is that your dog's going to mm. potentially stay in pain um and then what are the alternatives to that and i think a really really useful conversation that maybe we don't have often enough is around what's the backup so if this doesn't work then what can we do instead yes and i think that's that's a really you know if, if a happens what's option b and so yes. if this non-steroidal doesn't work there's, here's, there's seven other things that we can potentially try if we want to and i think that's i think that's, that's that you've hit and, with your bet too i think you've hit a nail head the sort of things that i find that i say now just out of habit from what i've learned doing cam is one i want owners to know that this might not be for life as well. A lot of owners are very scared about using non not just because they're worried about side effects, they're worried about it being a long-term commitment. And that comes with fear of where it could lead, the finances, the commitments, oh, just huge concerns. So I will always have the conversation saying, we're gonna see how this works. And if we get everything else in place, there's a big opportunity that we're either gonna reduce the dose or maybe even come off of it completely. And that really inspires people to put the other changes in place. I also talk about doing a blood panel. I'm like, like, obviously we know that this could, and it's very, very low, you know, but let's be doubly safe. Let's do a urine sample and let's do a blood panel. You know, let's keep an eye on species. You know, you be consistent with your diet. You know, don't keep giving all the tidbits. Let's just keep an eye on his stools. So there's, there's, there is a lot that we can do. Yeah. Um, Moving on from the fear of non-steroidals, could we? Oh no, actually, can we do brain? Because yeah. it's brain. Yeah. Just go back. Do brain, so owners can go into the consult room with a really good structure. Okay, cool. Too. So this is something I learned from human healthcare, um, and it's something that the human healthcare professionals are really trying to advocate doctors to do, and patients to kind of to, to request. And it's a structure that's either called BRAN or BRAIN. Um, and so when you think about any treatment choice you're trying to make, this works equally with supplements, with ramps, with whatever you want to want to talk about. Benefits. So what's the benefits of taking this? So what's what's it going to do for my dog? How is it going to help me? How is it going to help the pair of us or our household, including the dog, get back to where we want to be? So it's B for benefits. R for risks. So what are the risks and what 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 might happen? And what would we do if that did happen? So how big is this risk? What's the magnitude likely to be of this risk? And if that risk were to occur, what would the next step be? And I think that that second part of that is really important rather than just talking about the risk. Well, actually, how would they be managed? Because actually lots of these risks are relatively easy to fix. If a problem occurs, there's a solution for it, but we don't always tell you that. So there's B for benefits, R for risks. A then is alternatives. So if I don't like this thing that we've talked about, the benefits and risks of, if I don't want to take an NZ, well, what are my alternatives? Well, actually, is it supplements or is it tramadol? It's a gabapentin, blah, blah, blah. I potentially in that, if you want to use the brain rather than brown, is intuition. So what does my gut instinct tell me? What do what's my what would I kind of prefer? 
And that's again for the vet and the owner can have those. You know, I, I think for your dog, this is the best thing. And this is why based on those benefits and risks. And the, the final one is N. So that's what what happens if I do nothing? Because an option mm -hmm. sometimes can be, I just want to leave it for now or I, I want to monitor it. But you need to, again, understand the benefits and risks of doing nothing. What's going to happen if I don't intervene at this point in time? And I think that's a big thing that, again, would be helpful if vets maybe did more with owners is some of the myth busting. We know that there are quite a few myths around treating dogs with OA. You know, the idea that some people think, oh, it's just old age. It's kind of normal for dogs to slow down. But a, a, quite a big myth that I think we hear a lot is that you want to wait till they're really bad before you start non steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. You almost need to get them to this point where they're, you know, they really nearly can't walk. We're going to save them because they'll be more effective later or I'm worried about the length. It's not even necessarily that clearly articulated. It's just something that's out there, I think, is, oh, it's better to wait till later with those, which there isn't evidence to suggest Where that did that true. ever I come know. from? So that's, that's, that's brand or brain. So what's the benefits? What are the risks? What are the alternatives? And what happens if I do nothing? And yeah. you can totally go into a conversation as an owner with those. And I think that's brilliant. Need to build in the time to really start structuring the way we talk about medicines choices. Which we know choices is a big like problem, that. Yeah. Is time. And yeah. I think I honestly, I daydream, I daydream about this. In the next five to 10 years, especially with the push that COVID's given us the whole vet industry is going to become online more not just to communicate between vets but to actually start pushing out into the public forum this kind of information and i would love to see vet practices nationally globally starting to fund bodies like us doing this backup where you support people we're here 24 7 365 saying what you didn't get time to say and we could do that for all chronic diseases, the diabetes, the epilepsy. No, you could know that you might have been a bit pushed in that consult, but you've sent them to somewhere safe where it's going to be evidence based, supportive, empathetic. Anyway, there you go. Yeah, no, big one, because I think signposting, but one of the things certainly that was really evident in the work that I did in my thesis and subsequent work that we've done both in um, in epilepsy, which is something I'm moving into looking at now, what's the owner experience is like having a dog with epilepsy and also in preventive healthcare consultations. So we did a, a package of work um, when I was at the University of Nottingham looking at what happens in vaccine consults, which again is very arthritis relevant because a lot of vets would say a lot of the arthritis cases they pick up that the owner wasn't necessarily aware of those those or, or where owners weren't really sure if the dog needed to come in they've got subtle signs didn't quite know what they mean those often present in vaccine consults and what we're finding again in all of those three three problem types is that the time pressure of the consultation is really apparent and that stretches from owners sitting in the waiting room seeing a busy waiting room thinking there are dogs out here that are sicker than mine cats out here that are mm. sicker than mine i don't want to waste the vet's time yes so i'm not going to have this conversation now because i can see they're busy or they're stressed or there's all these people waiting or they're running 20 minutes late i'm just going to save that and actually maybe that was a really important conversation that they needed to have it it might have been an oa conversation i'm just a bit worried my dog's getting a bit but sick do you know or... what i i do think covid i know it's really bad and you know this is this is just a glimmer of hope in in a very negative situation we're in it has really shaken the tree for what could be and we could find that the future holds that you have a conversation by phone with no distractions before the dog is actually seen you know how amazing would that be because mm -hmm. for the vet okay sorry mums and fathers you know you're there you're trying to look at the dog trying to ask questions and the the mum's pulling the child off of the sideboard the table playing with the computer keys they the phone rings they've got brought the other dog for company they can't find their vaccination card in the deep 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 handbag and you're like ah <laughs> so yeah. being able to have a conversation prior no distraction yeah what are your concerns now let's get on with the consultation and bring in all these variables and distractions yeah. so much the future could hold for us it's very very exciting if you want to yes. ask a paddle. um let's we have got lovely comments please keep coming guys keep putting your stuff down here what i want to do is just step back a little bit we were talking about waiting to use non-steroidals which ties in very nicely about um what you found that owners find it very difficult to see pain and vet professionals do too. 
I'm just going to do a quick analogy just to make people understand that waiting until you really need an non-steroidal is daft. So we've got leaks in my house at the moment, my parents' house. And if my dad was to choose to keep ignoring these leaks, then likely the whole roof is going to fall down. Whereas actually plugging them now would make quite a lot of sense. And there's a little bit of an element of truth in non-steroidals here. If you use them early and get on top of that pain, you don't get all the secondaries. You don't get potential sensitization. It doesn't snowball out of control. So have that confidence to have that chat with your vet. And sorry, vets, if you speak to a vet who seems really hesitant, ask them why and say, I'm confident that this is this is something that's needed. My, I, I believe my dog is really uncomfortable. I've done a clinical metrology instrument <laughs> to help me along my path. But let's talk now about this owner having difficulty seeing it and vets difficulty. Tell us more about that. Cool. So this is a really big thing that came across in both the focus groups with vets and the interviews with owners. And I'll start with owners. And I think yeah. one of the things that... Um, is a really apparent barrier in the consulting room when you get a vet and an owner together to talk about osteoarthritis for the first time is about pain. Mm. And it's one of the things that we kind of, we want to treat osteoarthritis. The way that vets have been taught almost to manage osteoarthritis, we want to manage it because it's a painful condition. And so our way of thinking about this is, is this animal in pain? Yes or no, really? Is it osteoarthritis? Then is it is it an osteoarthritis dog that's, that's sore? And so that's the key kind of trigger word, or the trigger thing we're looking for. But what we know is that there's two different, well, lots of different types of pain, but we can broadly split them into what we call acute pain and chronic pain. So mm. acute pain is you've just trodden on a drawing pin and it's in your toe and you're hopping about on one leg. You're probably swearing a bit. You're probably mm. rubbing your foot. And so that's like a dog standing on something sharp or breaking its leg or suddenly rupturing its cruciate. It's totally fine. And then it pulls up and it's on its three legs. It's potentially vocalizing, so making some noise. They don't always, it's really, I think, um, breeds temperament dependent how brave some of these dogs yeah. are, individual specific, which again makes it really, really tough. Um, so that's acute pain. But what we think we get predominantly with osteoarthritis is is more chronic pain and that's a lot more subtle so as one of the vets brilliantly said in, in the focus groups you know when you've got backache you don't spend your whole life walking around going ow 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 mm. ow ow all the time you so you don't vocalize you get on with life if you've got a bit of a sore knee you don't hop everywhere you maybe no. hobble a little bit but these signs are then a lot more subtle and so what we haven't done a very good job as yet as a profession is teaching owners how to recognize these signs of chronic pain or even necessarily knowing what they are ourselves I think quite as well as we might do when an owner spots them at home and so that's what the thesis was really handy for so owners were saying early things that, that I'm sure lots of people watching this will, will absolutely recognize early things they spotted and they were often intermittent they'd often come one day and go the next day so you'd be like did I see that was I just making it up? Maybe there were seven of the reasons why that happened. Would be around stiffness, potentially being a bit slower on walks, maybe panting a little bit more, a little bit more reluctance to get out of bed, maybe being a little bit more sad than usual. They weren't these classic, I've just pulled something and it really hurts, typically yeah. with these arthritis dogs. And so, I mean, if your dog's a bit stiff in the morning, it's totally understandable that you might not be rushing it down to the vets the next day. Now, some vets, some owners will will be super on it and will want to do that and we'll get the little things checked out and that's totally cool but there'll be other people that just say I'm not going to bother my vet with this or I'm really busy or I'm just going to wait and see what happens. Do you know what that's actually really common the amount of people that apologize to me yeah. when they come in the room they say I'm really sorry this is probably nothing yeah. but and I'm like oh my god don't ever say that it's a yeah. word to you and it's something that you've seen I had one little lady, it's a really sad story. Sorry, guys, I'm going to make you cry. Her dog had something called a GDV, a gastric dilation vulvalus, and she waited until the vets had opened because she didn't want to wake the vet up. So this is when I was working in Yorkshire when I qualified years ago, like 18 years ago. And unfortunately, she was so polite and so didn't want to disturb the vets. The dog didn't make it. And, you know, you oh, if something worries you, you're allowed. It's a service provider. We're service providing, you know, do vocalise it. Yeah, definitely. So there's all those little subtle signs that you might see as signs of chronic pain. 
but you might not necessarily know that they're pain. They're just something that's not quite right. And so then what happens when the when the dog goes into the consulting room is that the vet will hear those words and will start to put together those as a picture of, oh, this sounds a bit like arthritis. Yeah. And then they will do an examination on that dog often, which I'm sure many people will have seen, where the dog's on the table or the floor, and they're feeling over its legs, they're moving those legs. And what they're doing is they're doing a combination of really complicated things at the same time that we've learned from our clinical teaching, but also from our clinical experience that are almost impossible to see as an observer. Mm. So we're feeling, how do the muscles feel? Is the dog tensing under our fingers? When I move this joint, can I move it more or less than the joint on the other side? And we're also looking at really subtle things like, does the dog slightly turn its head and look at me when I'm doing that? Or does it slightly flinch away? And those are our tests then that we would do to put on top of the words you've given us yeah. to assess whether or not that dog's in, in, in potentially in pain. But the, the problem that we, we seem to be having is that because we're not explaining necessarily how the tests we've done fit together with those signs you've seen at home of stiffness, mm. of slowing down, of panting, it, it may be that sometimes we have a bit of a disconnect because the vet might be thinking, oh, this owner's never going to believe me. This dog's in pain. Look, it's so obvious this dog's in chronic pain. It's really clear from this examination. We're mm. actually to the owner. Well, it might not be that clear because it, what, that, what we're looking at and we're trained to do is really subtle stuff. And we forget that. But mm. also we're not necessarily contextualizing that back and then saying, oh, well, actually, when your dog's stiff or when it's punting or when it's it's not keen to get up, actually, those are signs of pain. And it's not the same kind of pain as when when, you know, when they stub their toe or they stand on something sharp yeah, yeah, yeah. to then try to build up um, a consensus between us that, yes, we're talking about the same thing. And I think yeah. sometimes, unfortunately, these conversations can happen where the owner's gone in thinking my dog's stiff or it's getting older, it's slowing down but don't know why that is. And the vet said, well, that's because this dog's in pain. And then we're having a mismatch where the vet's saying, well, obviously you can see the dog's in pain. And the owner said, well, no, I can't. I didn't see anything change yes. then when you did that test. And then you're off on the wrong footing. And it's very yeah. frustrating for the owner because they've gone in with this thing that they're still not sure whether it is a thing. And maybe the vet's inadvertently made them think actually that, that it wasn't particularly significant and the vets may be sitting there thinking oh these people like why don't they understand they won't listen to me they brought this dog in for my professional communication opinion. everything but, is about yeah, communication. we, we were laughing is. just before we went live is that let's take the emotion out of this let's take the the finances let's take that and let's just look at every other situation in life where there's miscommunication you're going to have a husband and wife at the dinner table and they're talking about the same topic and they're on completely different, different platforms yeah. so what we can do to help that out and i am going to pick up a cam tool and i'm hoping one of the followers one of like laura or lynn will put it up we have a document called the suspicion of chronic pain document so it's a pdf and it's there for owners to print off and use at home if they've got something that they're like is this something and it's um it's divided into our cam factor and it's got behavior change posture change capability and gait change and physical changes and then there's a space to write three things or more if you want to that fit those categories and if you're like well yeah he doesn't do this anymore and he stopped doing that and he started doing this and his posture's really changed and he's got a quiver on his back leg and he now drags his, his right hind every now and you just hear the little scuffing of pads and his coat's changed, he's developed this big mane and his body shape's changed. Oh my God, I filled all this form in. I go in and go, hello, smorgasbord, got reasons to think there's chronic pain. So you've got that, but there's also, the vet could use it because you could have it tucked behind the computer screen and you could use it by saying, look, well, you've told me this, I'm filling in this section, I've seen this. You've agreed that you've seen this too. Look, we've actually got quite a lot of evidence here and they all meet at chronic pain. Yeah. So there is, There are tools out there we can use. Adding to that and bringing in the non steroidals so people can understand how complex this is. When I've been in a consult room and I've seen that the dog's obviously in pain and the owner's not come in with that as a problem and I've tried to have the conversation that your dog is in pain and pain and fat are two things that always create an emotive response and then I want to prescribe a non-steroidal and have a conversation about a potential side effect is just like pushing a boulder uphill yeah. you're just like that is something that I can't do in 10 minutes yeah. I can bring so many emotional topics it's just like an incendiary device in the room isn't it yeah so um it's, it's, it's complex. We've got to come up with a better way that we can do it. 
And it's really tricky. And I think that's a really big challenge with osteoarthritis is that it is often picked up as a it's it's not always the reason that owners will bring their dog in for having seen these subtle signs it is often you know it's a vaccine consultation or it's come in with a lump and either the vet will pick something up and then be trying to work out whether or not it's something to start introducing in that consult maybe they don't have time to do it at all and think yeah i'm just going to leave this actually because there's other things that owners come for that we're not in the right headspace today i don't have time to do it justice and so they may notice something and potentially not mention it just because it isn't the right time and space to, to yeah. do that um, but equally there may be owners who are who are you know are not wanting to say those things because the priority is is on other topics and yeah. it is a very very difficult consultation when you've got 10 or 15 minutes and there are these other things that are the priority and you need to deal with those first and i think mm. for vets there's a really good book i'm just going to fish out Ooh. which i would recommend uh, or get the camera right. Ooh. It's this one called A GP Consultation Reimagined, A Tale of oh. Two Houses by a man called Martin Brune. And he's a GP, he's a human, I'll hold it there so you can see it. He's a human GP. I've got no uh, vested interest in selling this book. I just love it. And <laughs> no, it. It's really, really good. And it <laughs> talks about how to deal with consultations like that, actually, mm. and about what the patient's priority might be what your doctor priorities might be and how to how to meet those in the middle and it, mm. it a lot of is around how to introduce these difficult topics how to gauge what owners know whether it's the right time or not so I think a really good way in for a vet would be to say there's something here actually else that I that I would like to talk to you about I'm you know worried your dog might have got this but I don't think now's the best time to talk about it mm can we arrange another consultation or can I give you this tool to fill in and then then I'll book you back in or mm. have a look at the canine arthritis management website because I'm suspicious that's what maybe your you know your dog has we don't need to talk about it now but let's park it for today but do let's come back to that and I'm going to prioritize that in my notes that next time you come in we're going to have that because we've got this real tendency to want to shoehorn everything in yes and you've got two minutes at the end of the consult and you're like oh by the way your dog that's got you know, it's in for a vaccine and we've talked about it's dental and I've clipped its nails. Oh, it's also got this 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 disease that's actually potentially going to be <laughs> lifelong and it needs all these medications and I've got to go now. So have these drugs. And I think that's that doesn't work well for anybody. And so no. having that signposting, but also as owners recognising that the value of having that second conversation, that it's worth committing to coming back, that it is yeah. worth coming back and you know, spending yeah. that specific bespoke time. And also really just if you are suspicious of something like stiffness, slowing down old age, as Hannah said, and I know it is really tricky with some practices at the moment that are an emergency service with COVID where maybe it is hard for practices to prioritise things that maybe aren't so urgent. But if you can, you know, go in there when you've just got a low level suspicion of something, then that's what that consultation is for. If you leave mm -hmm. it for a vaccine consult and say, oh, I'll just mention it next time I'm in. It's going to be really challenging to do a good job because we're going to be talking about vaccines and fleas and worming and dental disease and the lumps and bumps mm. that are on there. And then there's this other elephant in the room that you and maybe the vet want to talk about, but you're probably going to run out of time. So yeah. if you can make, if you can have the choice of making this its own consult by you booking an appointment for it, please, please do do that rather think than thinking I'm going to review it when I'm there with something else. Yeah. And I think if you were to have a conversation with the receptionist and say, I know I'm coming for the vaccine, but I've also got these concerns. The receptionist that might be a pretty astute little person go, do you know what that needs to uh, let's put you at the end of the surgery because this is going to overrun so mm. be communicative do yeah. not be scared say yeah. what you need and, and if, if, if you're in a consult room with a vet who you don't think is listening to you or don't think is taking you seriously you can totally ask for a second opinion if that's what you want to do that's totally you know it's legit to do that you can ask is there a vet that's particularly interested in old dogs or is there a vet that's got an interest in arthritis or is there a nurse clinic about geriatric pets yes. is there a leaflet oh. I can take do you don't you know and, and equally vets if it's something that you don't like dealing with but you've got a colleague who loves you know if you're a surgeon and you're doing gp consults and you hate consulting but you've got a colleague who really really likes crusty old dogs like me um yeah. send them my way like that's a win-win situation of saying well yeah, i tell you what definitely. there's a colleague in the practice who really likes these cases i really recommend you know you see yeah. them instead but equally as owners take that and run with it if you can do it's not the vet trying to make more money by doing a second consult it's really no. really not it's it's because there's so much to talk about in these there consults is so much to talk about I've, that we need I the spent, time to do it on its own yeah i spent years trying to i try to perfect 
the OA consult, how I could get everything, everything. It's not possible. I've tried. Um, just to big up CAM and vet professionals and owners. In the CAM shop, there are little business cards that have all the CAM details of how you can find the different resources. There's no sales. It's not about selling anything. It's about directing people to somewhere safe. You can buy a pack of 100 of them for £4.99 and all the money goes to CAM. So you can have them underneath your computer terminals and you can just hand them out, hand them out. You can staple them to the invoices. You can put them in the prescription bags. And owners, think how amazing this would be if you go to your vets with a pack and say, this has been a really helpful resource. Please help someone else. This is my gift to you. Start giving them out because it really does make a difference. You can scribble it on a piece of paper, but by having the cards, it looks very professional. And it also helps Cam because we're self-funded. Um, also, somebody said about a questionnaire. Where were you? That lovely lady, Becky Hitchum. There you go. Questionnaire, email to clients at time of booking appointment. Yes. Now, we also have that too. And I'm sure the lovely Lynn or Laura will um, put a little link into the thread. There is a questionnaire we've written. You can print it off. You can fill it in. You can take it to the vets. Or if you're a vet or a nurse, you can print it off and send it or email it. So that is also provided for you. Um, I really do want to. Well, there's loads of stuff talking about other treatments. If we get a chance, we'll, go, we'll come back to it. Cool. Can we just talk about your lecture that you gave about yeah. I know it's going to be slightly, but please do, because I think it's really, really important to hear this. Should we be worried about Dr. Google or is Dr. Facebook more scary? Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yes, yeah, so I didn't talk to you years ago at a conference, which was a topic that I put forward, actually, because I'm, I'm just really interested in, I'm interested in information and disinformation and how we understand risk, how we communicate risk and how, how we, how both vets and owners learn. I'm really, really interested in, in that. And one of the clear things in the thesis was, as Hannah said, Mabel by the poo bin. Is that what she's called, Mabel? Is that right? Mabel. She's Mabel. Mabel. She lives by the poo bin. Cool. Got it. Um, lots of owners. And again, totally understandably, we'll meet up with other owners and say, oh, your dog looks like my dog. My dog's on this drug that I think is amazing, this supplement that I think is fantastic. I really recommend you try it. Or especially, again, if owners haven't got a particularly great relationship with a vet or if they've heard about something that the vet hasn't mentioned, they've not been able to find much information about. It's really common to talk to other people. But if you live in a rural area or if you don't know people with dogs with arthritis or if you just want something quick to look up, it's it's really easy to hop on to hop onto Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so what this talk was about is, you know, should we be worried about that? Because there was a survey that the British Veterinary Association had done that said something like 98 percent of vets were really worried about owners um, using Google and thought that it led to poor outcomes for their pets. And a very, very recent study has just come out that also said showed that veterinary nurses actually had similar attitudes towards owners using the Internet. We, we as professionals are really worried about the quality of information on there not being as good as it could be which is why cam is obviously is great but also is a bit on us as a profession to say well if we think it's all bad we should be doing what hannah's done and putting good information on there instead of, and promoting it we can't just shout at people for doing what you know is it we all do what the healthcare profession tells us to do nhs you know online nhs 111 is absolutely brilliant loads of really really good stuff on there because they've spent the time putting it on there and the mm. big problem when i did this talk was and still now is that there's lots of lots of poorer quality information out there. Mm. And the problem with getting information on social media, Hannah and I were discussing this just before we started, was around how Facebook algorithms, for example, promote specific posts. Mm. And, you know, it, it's really complicated, actually. And it's really easy to Facebook and uh, will learn what you like and will show you more and more of what you like. And mm. will also hide stuff that haven't people haven't interacted with very much and so it's very easy to start seeing more and more of something that pushes you in a certain direction and the social media companies love posts that are emotive that make you happy make you sad make you angry those are the ones that get lots of engagement and so unfortunately those are the kinds of things that tend to get more shared so it means we're more likely to see them and those tend mm. to be the ones potentially that aren't quite so information based and so I would say a re this really helpful call tool called Trust 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 or Trash .org, which mm. is a really simple three step thing that you can you can do when you're looking at any website. And I'm totally cool with people using Google if they want to, using Facebook certainly for stuff like this if they want to. But do it 
with your brain on knowing what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So what that tells you to do is it says, basically it's telling you to work your inner skeptic. So if you're on a website, you want to say, first of all, here's some information. Who's written this information? Is this written by a drug company? Is this written by a supplement company? Is this written by somebody who's got a financial interest in me buying this thing? Who are they? Can I see their name? Can I see the name of the person? Or is it just an anonymous thing? If I can see their name, are they a person who I believe knows what they're talking about? So is this a post that's been written by a vet, for example, or is this something that's been written by a marketing person? Or does it not say? And if it doesn't say, you need to be more skeptical. Mm. It then says also check out when it was written. So is there a date on there? Was this written 20 years ago? Was this written two days ago? Can you tell? And that, if you start even applying those two really simple rules to posts, I think it starts to make a really big difference to just think, hang on, stop a sec, do I believe this? And now with the arrival of CAM, I think it's there's so much good quality information, there's less of a need to go to these to these other sites and, 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 and read stuff. But obviously you're gonna do that, you'll hear about something, it's totally natural that we'll want to look it up, but do try and find an independent information source of, you know, like that CAM. Note, um, on that note, I was walking the dog today. I was like, oh, I wonder how many of the owners think that I am very biased. You know, so I we have a big team behind the screen, but believe it or not, there's about 30 to 40 people working on CAM at any one point. We have a huge team of independent advisors. So we have nutritionists, we have orthopedic surgeons, we have specialists, we have um, neurologists, we have internal medicine people. So it isn't just my opinion. So we have a very broad range behind the screen. But we have a very veterinary attitude and I'm very aware that there is also a very different world out there. There's people, um, somebody just talked about traumial and zeal and using cold lasers and um, thermography and stuff like that. There is a different world out there that isn't commonplace in, in general practice. Now, please, if you have got questions, pose them to us, email them to me. I'm more than happy to look into them, but I am gonna be honest. And that's something that people have got to bear in mind. There is no vested interest. There is no financial gain in CAM. We just put out what is known. Now, if there isn't very much about it, we'll say there's not very much about it. No evidence doesn't mean it doesn't work, but it means no evidence. Why is there no evidence? Come on, guys, let's think about this. And I think um, Mike Konzemius uh, on Monday said it very powerfully of, a lot of companies are making a lot of money out of a lot of stuff and they're not doing any trials to actually back up what they're selling. I was like, mm, true. So yes, we will investigate it and we will find you the information that you need. Yeah. What I would say just to follow on from that, if that's okay, <laughs> is, it's totally like, it's fine to try stuff. And if there's the treatments that you want to try, whether it's turmeric, whether it's magnetic collars, that maybe vets will say, well, there isn't much evidence for that. And as Hannah said, absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence. It just means we don't know. But equally, it may be that there have been trials done where things haven't worked in most dogs. Mm -hmm. It's OK to try those things as long as, again, you've thought through your own brand or you've got some information about what are the risks. And mm -hmm. also you've just thought through what if I do this, what's it stopping me doing? So if I'm spending money on this expensive thing, is it going to be stopping me spending money on something that maybe would be better? But then it, it's really important to set your own parameters, either on your own or working with your vet, to work out, well, what am I hoping this will do? And can I then see that that's happened within a period of time? So it's what we can do, call doing an N of one trial, where you say, well, I'm going to try this in my dog, but what I want to see it doing is I want to see it being better going up and down steps, or I want to see it panting less, mm. I want to see it being better getting out of bed. And set yourself, try and find a way of measuring it. And again, Mike Kinzemius, Hannah, have talked about this lots of times in the past about these different tools you can use to assess differences. Try and only change one thing at once. So try not to introduce a new food and a new bed and a new supplement because then you're not going to have a clue what made a difference. But be, it's totally cool. And I get that you might feel really guilty doing it. And this is something that came across quite strongly. You don't want to stop something just in case it was helping. Yes. But especially when we're working around this level where the evidence isn't very strong, where, you know, we just don't know because the studies haven't been done for whatever reason in these things. Don't feel committed to keeping giving them for years and years because the costs can really rack up. The side effects might rack up. It might stop you doing something else. Because if you get five supplements, and then a sixth thing comes along, which actually is really good. That's six things to be giving your dog every day. 
like you could maybe just be giving the one more effective one because you've screened out individually right i'm going to try this for my dog and it hasn't worked for my dog doesn't mean it's not going to work for somebody else's dog but it's not worked for my dog please don't feel guilty about stopping something that you can't see being effective there's yes. lots of these alternatives that are kind of sold as or oh, well you won't see it working but it'll be doing this magic joint protecting thingy in the background and there really isn't a good amount of evidence that if you can't see it helping that it is still doing something and what you can always do is try taking it away see if you notice a difference if you notice oh gosh it's got worse again totally cool like put it back in that's fine yeah. but if you and don't I think, notice I think you'll... You stop it, just please don't feel you have to keep giving it you know it's not no it, and i think this isn't is helping this is really, really coming from two people whose hearts and souls were broken when we lost our dogs. And we know what it's like where you are desperate. You're desperate to do anything. Like I'm getting tearful again. I still haven't got over it. It's ridiculous. And you will try anything. You will try anything. But do keep your rational brain on because the only person that is really gaining is the company. Like Holly didn't want to be forced different pills, potions and have different things being done to her she wanted to grow old gracefully my bank balance couldn't take any more towards the end i did i did say three and a half thousand pounds in the last two months of her life oh. it was nuts so um it is totally from the heart it's not us trying to be stick in the mud yeah and work with your vet on this a buddy with a friend on this like get somebody else yes. in on you with it so it's not just all you because there's so much responsibility and there's so much guilt when this is you and your dog and it's a really tight unit you want them to live as long as you can you want them to be pain-free you want to not feel guilty that you didn't do something you didn't spot something you didn't try that thing that maybe like the poo bins just told you about and you're like oh god i didn't hear about that like please try and if you can manage that guilt as much as you can because if you didn't know about something then you couldn't have done it so you don't need no. to feel guilty about that but equally no. don't feel guilty about stopping stuff and it's so so hard Tara and I both know when, you, when you're living this it's so hard to make a rational decision so do bring your vet on board help to help put some of these practices in place use video clips so I'm going to get a video today of my dog going up and down the steps um, I'm going to get a video of how excited my dog was when I got the lead out. Then I'm going to try this supplement, this therapy, this whatever. And then I'm going to try stopping it again and we'll, or, or video again in a couple of months' time. Then look back at that old video. Is there actually any appreciable difference or not? And equally, yeah. if somebody's trying to sell you something, if it's a physical therapy, if you're going to see a physio or you're going to see somebody using a vet, even in there's something you don't think's working, please do have the confidence to tell them i want to stop this like i don't think it's working what or, or at least to say well what are the alternatives to this and really yeah. make sure with everything you take on please set yourself some parameters to think about what do i want this to do how am i going to tell if it's helped or not and give yourself a stop point and please don't also don't make other people feel guilty if they've stopped something that worked in your dog that didn't work in their dog like yes. that because it, it does seem to be individual specific we know it's the same for human arthritis human chronic pain different things work for different people different things work for different animals just because it's worked for you doesn't mean it will for mabel's dog equally if it was brilliant for mabel's dog maybe it won't do anything for yours you have to try it but i cannot say strongly enough like be be comfortable with be prepared to be comfortable with stuff. your own brain space yeah is so important and, and I reach out for help when you're stuck because it god it's hard to make decisions by yourself the more you can involve your vet the vets the more you can have owners and work as a team on this well that's why friend. we created holly's army that, yeah. that is holly's army and it's brilliant um, I, I always talk about um lovely leslie saunders you know she had a dog called max and she said to me one day i live in a house full of people but i feel alone and, and you know making the decisions for max is a huge pressure on me and I just don't know who I can turn to. So Holly's Army is a beautiful place, guys. Please do go um, sign up. It's run by Cambastas that I have just the biggest love for because they are dog owners like you that have had further training so that they can help advise you. Um, so because your screen is breaking up, I, I, one, want to get you back because we haven't touched on half of what I wanted to talk about. But your screen's breaking up a little bit. Let's do our 10 top tips um, and then leave it tonight and we'll be able to get you back in the future because everybody loves you because you're amazing. Um, I 
what I will do is I will go through your questions afterward, guys. Please pull your hearts out. We want to see loads and loads of writing on this feed today. But let's begin with the 10 top tips. So these apply to anybody of any financial background, any accessibility. Um, these are core things that might sound really small that make changes. So I'm going to start with number 10. And mine is always going to be boring. Four rugs, less drugs. I just can't say it enough. Please, guys, look at the terrain, the surfaces that your dogs are walking on. It's a no-brainer. Once you put your rugs down, you'll see the dogs migrate towards them. They lay on them. They're like, oh, this is safe. This is safe zone. Do it. Number nine. Okay. Uh, I am a bit obsessed with dog sniffing. I love dog sniffing. I think it's a really, really positive thing for their welfare to let them sniff. It's really strongly motivated, it seems to be, in, in older dogs. But it means that you can't walk as fast. So Hannah had this great temper of a, was it a sniffari that you call it? A sniffari. <laughs> sniffari. So I would say if you've got an older slow dog, try to use it as a mindfulness exercise that you're not going to be walking a specific circuit in a specific time. If they want to sniff, let them sniff. That's their social interaction. It's so important for their brains. That's their that's their day out. They'll sleep well. They'll dream well. They've got stuff to think about. Don't. It's. I know it's really annoying to stand there with the dog on the end of the lead sniffing. Like I've done that. I've been like, come on, I've got to go to work, and you've been sniffing this bit of grass for ten minutes. If you can <laughs> make the space to let them do that, do it because they're not going to speed up. They need to do it. They want to do it. Let them do it because it's important. Yes, I love that one. Okay, my one is a is a, a bit of a vague one. Give it time as well. I said this on the Kinzemus one, I think, the other day. These medications, these interventions, they take time to take effect. Um, I meet so many owners that feel that giving medication or an intervention or whatever it will be is like a flick of a switch. And by the next day, you should see improvement. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. And a lot of these dogs are suffering chronic pain. It's been there for a long time. It's taken a long time building itself to where it's going to be. You can't just knock it down. It doesn't work like that. It's not a Jenga tower. You've got to unwind it slowly. So what you need to do is when you've got a deterioration is you've got to not only distract your dog, keep them busy, keep them entertained, but you need to distract yourself as well. And the biggest tip I can give you is Get your slow feeders out, get your licky mats, get your snuffle mats, get all of these things in place because it keeps you happy, keeps your dog distracted, moving, engaged, pleasantly happy whilst things take time to affect because nothing comes with a 24-hour kick around. Number seven. Equally, though, I guess off the back of that, then you can stop stuff. Don't give stuff for a year thinking, well, maybe it will work in two years' time, three years' time. And it's really hard to get that time window right. And some of the medications will come with an indication of that. Your vet may well be able to help you with that. Don't expect this to be overnight. But also, if it's been four months and you've really not noticed anything, it may well not be the right thing for you and for your dog. So then pop back to your vet, try withdrawing it, see if it, see if you can notice a difference, put it back on if you do, stop it if you don't, yeah. don't feel guilty about doing that. These, yes. you know, these dogs change with what they're going to need. It may be that something isn't appropriate now, maybe, maybe would be more appropriate for them later. They, you know, it's a dynamic disease, it really is. So you'll need to chop and change stuff. Be aware that, that your vet will potentially be wanting you to do that too. I love it. I love it. Okay, number six for me. I want you to all go back about two posts in this thread. I did a coping with COVID, I think it was day 19 or day 20, and it was about a dog that was running down the garden for a short one minute chasing a squirrel. And all the damage that was done running across the slippery floor, over the threshold, down the patio, across the steps, bouncing up and down, up and down, up and down at the brick wall, looking at that squirrel for a couple of minutes of pleasure, well, perceived pleasure was that dog actually happy or was it just compulsive but that's another story um if you could actually think well if i stop him doing that and the damage that does and the pain that creates and all of the negative impact that has i'm going to get a longer walk i'm going to get further on my sniffari that dog's going to come with me and be comfortable at the cafe walk with the coffee you do have to look at what your dog's doing and some of these routine habit compulsive behaviors can be quite damaging by modifying that you're going to get gains elsewhere so look at things that you think that's not going to be good for arthritis can i stop it can i modify it because i will see the returns elsewhere 
number five. Cool. Um, I'm going to get pick up Brown or Bray again here. I think for both vets watching this and for owners to really think about benefits, risks, alternatives. What do I do? Nothing. And what's my gut instinct telling me here? I think it's such a powerful way of making decisions and thinking things through. You can write it out on a bit of paper. You can talk it through and get really when you're at the beginning of this OA journey, spend as much time as you can understanding what the landscape's like almost really. And again, there's great resources out here. You may start on one thing and may need to stack multiple things on top of that. Um, as time goes on but try and work out from that with your vet what's the best suite of things to start off with you but if you're not sure ask questions if you haven't had it well enough explained to you don't be shy but it may be that your vet will say I just don't have time for that now you need to come back again but you know it is worth paying for that do make that separate appointment where you've got both got the stress-free time you can even potentially leave your dog at home or do it on the phone like talk to them yes. about what's possible but you know, those are the really important conversations to have. The more you understand, the more you can build up a relationship together at the beginning of this disease, the better outcome I think you'll probably have because you'll be working in partnership rather than working at potentially cross purposes. Love it. And I'm going to add to that with number four is that Cam has just done a 12 webinar series courtesy of Hills Pet Foods that's gone out to 1300 vet nurses around the globe now so we're talking great numbers those nurses are gagging to run OA clinics they are desperate to be showing their skill base their talent their empathy their knowledge go to your vets and say you know do you run an OA clinic do your guys run um, your, your nurses are they doing anything generally with a nurse clinic it will be of less expense. Um, many of them do charge, but it's a nominal fee. They're longer, so you will find that they're a lot longer. And nurses have been found to be better listeners. <laughs> and they offer more empathy. And they've even been found to potentially be more um, able to identify pain. So um, please do make sure that you use your practice resources. Nurses are fantastic. Number two free for you? Mm, um, it's a bit of a tricky one, I think. There's another conversation that came up lots in my thesis that we don't necessarily have as well as we could do is around the really sad topic of euthanasia and how we decide about when to do that. And I think this is a conversation that sometimes vets and owners both, both want to have, but are too worried to engage with the other one. The owner's a bit worried they'll be judged if they start talking about this too early. The vets worry that they're going to hideously upset an owner if they start talking about it too early. But it, it is something that, unfortunately, for lots of dogs with arthritis, it's a decision that you, you probably need to make. And there's loads of great resources out there. But also to really flag Blue Cross Pet Bereavement Support Service, is so, it's a free phone line. They've got an email service as well. They're really happy to talk to owners in what we call this anticipatory grief phase, which is before you've put your pet to sleep, when you know it's coming, you know you've got to make that decision and you're racked with the guilt, the uncertainty, the how am I going to cope? I don't want to let them go. All of that stuff, they're there. And equally, if you feel like that, do talk to your vet about it around setting some ballparks and around what will happen. You know, your vet can talk you through what would happen on the day, what your options would be for afterwards. And just knowing that in advance can sometimes really, really help set your mind at rest that you've got a plan that you know what's going on so it's it's really sad to talk about it but it is something to not you know if if you are worried about it do do engage in it rather than just shying away from it um that's a really, really tricky one. one there's um there's a couple of um interviews with andrew hales and i will put a link for them because i suffered really badly with anticipatory grief yeah, ridiculous <laughs> And I didn't know it existed. And I put a post up on CAM, and this was about 2017, 2018, when we were only about a thousand people. And I had like 159 replies within two days saying, oh my God, is that a thing? That's what I have. So it's really, really common. So mm -hmm. yes. um, my number two is, I wish I had known what I know now 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I really, really, do carry a lot of guilt that I didn't have the knowledge that I do now through the first 10 years of my career. Now, how can we get around this? How can you guys make me feel better? Because I'd like you to. Talk to other people. 
talk to people about the signs of pain, talk to people about the, how common this condition is. We believe it can be anywhere between 35 and believe it or not, 60 percent of the dog population. So Duncan Lascelles is thinking 35 percent, but he thinks it can be more. Uh, Professor Daryl Millis is thinking it could be as high as 60 percent. It's a very, very common condition. The signs of chronic pain are subtle. And we've just had a lovely lady who is awesome. Hats off to you, Lynn JT, who was asking, is panting a potential sign of chronic pain? The fact that she's just written, thank you for your response. I was not aware of this. It's amazing to find new things so I can help with pain relief. This is the attitude that we want. This is exactly the attitude we want. So my number two is start talking about this with your dog friends, with your family, with your colleagues at work. Don't be shy about it. Let's get it out there because you're going to help someone. Number one for you. Hmm. Not necessarily a tip, but I guess it's something that I want to signpost. It's something that I really want to do in a conversation, I think, nationally that I want to change is that having a chronically ill dog pet is really difficult for an owner. And I, I guess giving the space to say I totally acknowledge that that's true. There's guilt, there's anticipatory grief, there's money, there's the time these things take, there's all the vet bills, there's so much uncertainty. And that is common and it's normal and it's not just arthritis, it's epilepsy, it's all of these conditions. And as a society, we're really, really bad at recognising that. And so one of the real things that I want to do with my research and the research I continue to do is try somehow to start changing that national conversation where we start to acknowledge that looking after an ill pet is really tough. And so have conversations with people, get support. Don't minimise it in your own mind that, oh, it's just a dog. I, I'm being ridiculous because you're not. This is a huge thing. It's probably akin to looking after an elderly person or, or, or after an ill child when you've got, a, you know, a severely affected dog with OA, I think, in terms mm. of the impact it has on your life. And, you know, it, it's OK. That's that is how life is. You, everybody that's got a dog like this, they're managing is doing an amazing job. But, you know, you, you'll need a break. You'll need somebody to talk to. You need support. And as a society, we're really, really bad. at This is an invisible bit of work. And I really hope that over the next 10 years, that's something that we can change, that we can start to change societal attitudes about just how tricky this is. And we're not there well, we yet. Can. And it's crap that we're not, but we will. Yeah, and we can do. And this is the thing is that every guest that ever comes on to CAM, the words that they hear is this is your platform, it's your choice, it's what you you want to say, this is your audience. And that's the same to you, the followers, you know, this is your platform too. You have the ability to change somebody else's future. So by you putting your time and your energy and your commitment into CAM, you're going to help other people. So, you know, please write, please comment. Um, what we hope to do is start collecting more info from you. So in the past, I put out a post saying, what were the signs of pain now that you know what you know? So when you look back, what did you actually see, but you didn't link two and two? And it was fascinating. People were like, well, now I know what I know. I know that he had trouble rolling over. He couldn't rub his back in the ground anymore. Or um, like the lovely Carol Starsky, um, Starkey has just said, he moved away from me, didn't want to sit near me anymore. And it's only later do you go, ah. Oh. And for me, Holly had um, a couple of occasions of nerve root signature where she would be running and then she'd sit down and hold her back leg up and it'd last 10 seconds. And then she wouldn't do it for a month. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> but you don't know what you don't know. So you. that we can change this. Sorry, I adore you. I just think you're a fat and you've got to come back. <laughs> so oh, I'm happy to do that. You, you're brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love thank all the guests to say thank you. And um, we will have Zoe Belshaw back in the new year, I hope. Until then, we will speak again. Thank you.